Good morning, my name is Ryan Cross, and I'm here to tell you about my capstone project. In my opinion, a capstone needs three things to be a truly good capstone. First, it needs to have a spiritual impact. This needs to be on both the CIK student and the community he is serving, he or she. Uh, second, it needs to be in some way career oriented. And by this, I mean, this needs to be something the student preferably would want to do or is interested in doing after they get out of high school or college. Finally, the project needs to be enjoyable. If you're not enjoying any aspect of your capstone project, you probably have selected the wrong capstone. So with this in mind, I came up with a few ideas my junior year of capstones I could do. First, I thought of starting a recycling program for CAK. That's something I had noticed we were lacking here at CAK, and I thought it would be a good capstone to do. But I was not incredibly passionate about that as a project, and I also felt it was lacking that spiritual impact. So I discarded that idea rather quickly. After that, I thought about being a sail camp instructor at Concord Yacht Club. I've gone to sail camp a few times, and I enjoy the work they do there. Um, I thought that would be a great way to get to know kids and learn how to teach kids in an environment like that. That would have been the, the summer in between my junior and senior year. But before that could happen, I got an opportunity to stage manage at Knoxville Children's Theater. So here's a brief description of my capstone. I was to be a stage manager at Knoxville Children's Theater. My mentor and director would be Dennis E. Perkins. The show we'd be working on is Lilies of the Field. And I knew it would be a long project, but I could not have told you going in that it would be 153 hours. So, there was one thing though that I thought I was missing for my capstone, and that was a spiritual impact. Now that might seem funny, because the more observant of you might have noticed, Lilies of the Field is a direct reference to Matthew 6, 28 through 29. I didn't notice this at first, but Matthew 6, 28 through 29 says this, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Which is from the Sermon on the Mount, and arguably is the message of the show, Lilies of the Field that God provides for the lilies, how much more will he provide for his children? A little bit of background about Lilies of the Field. It is a book that was published by William E. Barrett. He published it in 1962. It deals with subjects such as racism, inter-ethnic relationships, and even faith. Also, it was turned into a movie in uh, the 1960s, and it was the first, it was the show, eh, the first movie to have an African-American actor given an Oscar for Best Actor. And rather than me explain the plot to you, I'm gonna let our lead actor explain it to you. So, Homer Smith is um, a man who decides to leave his hometown in South Carolina and just move west. He doesn't really have a plan, but he just decides to get up and take off. He finds himself with these nuns who want him to build this chapel for him, but he doesn't really want to do that. He just wants to be take, take off. Hey, that's the nuns calling. My name's Smith. See the fellow who's building the chapel for him? They convince him to stay and build a chapel. I almost forgot to have a problem for you. Try this in the car. Show up for your kids. And him, along with his community, come together and build a chapel for these nuns. So. He's kind of falling out of touch with his roots and meeting these friends who really want him to build this chapel and want him to come, want him to come to church with them. It kind of brings him back to that religious foundation. Yeah, so even before we had all of us uh, uh, set and even across, just minding that, it just gave me this really nice energy from doing that. It's because it's such a sweet moment. Now that you know a bit about the plot, let me introduce you to my mentor, Mr. Dennis E. Perkins. So I met Dennis five years ago at Knoxville Children's Theater. He directed the third play I was in there. And since then, I've done four shows with him, multiple camps, and a few classes. 
Dennis is very particular, and some might even say demanding, but a little bit more about his professional side. He's directed at KCT since 2011. He's a University of Tennessee graduate. He stage managed at Clarence Brown Theater. He also has directed twice in Hungary and has performed in Chicago. That leads me into my first and main fear, which was working for Mr. Perkins. Um, because we knew each other and because I knew him, I knew what a challenge it would be to work for him. He would expect everything out of me. He would expect the best. And I also knew that he would know how to get me to do that. He knew what it would take to push me to my limit and get that work out of me. So that did concern me a little bit. Um, second, I had a lack of stage managing experience. Most stage managers at KCT have at least taken a class before they go into their first job. I have taken no classes and not ever stage managed before, so I knew I was coming in completely clean with no experience. Finally, I've seen many stage managers work and I know it's a challenge. It's not an easy job. I've seen them work at Oak Ridge Playhouse, Clarence Brown Theater, uh, even at Gov School, and I know it is a tough, demanding job that takes a lot out of a person. So with all that in mind, I was a little bit nervous going into this capstone. I quickly learned there are three key aspects of stage management. First, there's the technical side, the organizational side, and the communication side. On the technical side, I had to learn how to operate the lights and sound. You can see there on the right, that is my light board, and I have two sliders with which I could adjust the uh, volume of the show, fade in and fade out sound cues. In the center, I have my lighting board. Uh, the main button I used in that was the go button, which would go to the next cue, but I did have the ability to stop the cue, go back, even cut to a blackout, or try to move the lights personally myself. A uh, fun story is, there was only one time I ever had to try to mess with the lights manually and see if I could get them to do something, and that was because for some reason or another, one of the LEDs on stage, a blue LED, refused to go off through the whole show. So even in the blackout, there would be a blue LED shining on the stage. And I was desperately sitting for the whole first act in the booth, trying with the manual controls to turn off that blue LED. I did not succeed. We had to fix it during intermission. Fun story. Um, I also helped build the set. You can see over there, that's the, like, the wood shop area where they build pieces for the set. Um, I did many, I tried to be as helpful as I could for the uh, set designer. He was working all by himself and I just thought he might need a hand to do easy tasks. So I painted the proscenium arch of the stage, which is the arch that goes around the stage. I painted that with a fresh coat of paint. Many pieces of set I painted for him, easy things like that. I also helped him cut pieces of wood into shapes he would need them. Things like that, just to help his job be easier. Next, there's the organization aspect of stage management. This is the most confusing of all the jobs I had to do. First, I had to keep a list of all needed props and costumes. That might sound simple, but it wasn't like Mr. Perkins would just say to me, Ryan, I need this, 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 and this. We would be in the middle of the scene, he would be directing the scene, and he would say, DJ, I want you to go over there and pick up that brick that's lying on the ground. And I would have to know in my head, brick, that's not been mentioned before, write that down. That's a new prop we need. Same thing for costumes. He would say, DJ, then you take off your ball cap. I would need to write, DJ has a ball cap, and I need to write that down. And then I'd have to take all that and send it out to the respective props mistress and the costume managers so they knew what they needed to get. Second, I wrote down all of the actors blocking. Now, let me explain a little theater terminology. Blocking is the path the actors take on the stage. It's like their, their movements, where they go, when, and all that. Again, I had to do that in the moment while he's reading it off to people. Often, I'd be sitting there, I'd be scribbling down in my binder all of my blocking, and I have it all written down. It would be terrible handwriting, so I'd have to go home every night, erase it all, write it back down as nice as I could, just in case one day I wasn't there and someone needed to use that blocking script to see what the blocking was. Um, I also had to create a shift plot for the actors, more theater terminology. A shift plot is a chart that assigns actors a certain job during a blackout to move a certain piece of set or prop. Now, this wouldn't have been a problem if we had a big cast. We were a rather small cast. So sometimes I would have six things that needed to be moved and only five people to do it. So it's a bit of human resource management, trying to make sure I got people where they needed to be. And sometimes you know, we had to have the bigger guys move the heavy tables and stuff. And so that was, that was fun and definitely a challenge to do. Find another thing, I had to manage actor attendance. That is actually my little attendance board right there. That was pretty simple. I just checked in actors when they arrived and when they 
was time to go home, I had to go to their parents and get their signature to sign them out. Finally, I wrote rehearsal and performance reports, which are pretty self-explanatory. After every rehearsal, I'd write up a report so that Dennis, the director, could go back and look and see exactly what we did during the show. Same thing for performances. This way, he did not have to be at all the performances. I could run the show if need be. Finally, probably the most challenging aspect was communication. Uh, as a stage manager, you act as a go-between between the director and the two technical uh, directors, the uh, lighting designer and the, the uh, set designer. Um, if Dennis wanted a certain thing in the set, I would have to go to the set designer, talk it out with him, make sure I explained it to him and everything he needed. Same thing with lights. If Dennis didn't like the way a certain light cue looked, I'd have to go to the lighting designer and say, hey, you need to change this, this, and this. I also helped coordinate with the costumes design designers and prop mistresses. I talked about that before. So here's a typical rehearsal schedule. We did 24 rehearsals of varying length. This is, uh, this is about a normal one. So let's say the actors are, are called at 6 o'clock. I would try to get there at 5.30, 30 minutes early, so that I could be there and set up ahead of time. During that time, I'd get out any props, costumes, set the stage, everything they would need, make sure there's enough chairs for everyone to sit in. Then I'd go and I'd probably have a talk with Dennis. Anything he wanted to tell me, anything I did bad last night, anything he wants me to focus on this rehearsal. Then, as we get close to 6 o'clock, I would start checking in the actors. They arrived, greeting them, talking with them, giving any notes Dennis wanted me to give to them. 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock would be the rehearsal. During that time, I'm taking notes, recording the blocking, and keeping track of breaks, which is an odd thing the stage manager has to do. At KCT, we have a policy of every hour you get a five-minute break, so it would be my job as a stage manager to keep my eye on the clock and make sure that we got those breaks at the right time. Finally, at 9 o'clock, the actors were dismissed, and I would check them all out. 9 o'clock to 9.10-ish, it varied. I would put away all the costumes, clean up anything that needed to be cleaned, put the, the theater back into the way it needed to be, put the chairs back in their rows, and if there was an actor whose parent wasn't there on time, I would sit and stay with them until their parent got there. Here's a typical show schedule. Here's where it gets a little bit more confusing. We did 14 of these, uh, again, at varying times in the day. Again, if it's a 6 o'clock call, I would get there 30 minutes early. I would set up again. I would talk with Dennis about the last show, explain to him anything that went wrong. Here, I would actually check with the tech booth. I would make sure all my first 10 cues of the show are working correctly, nothing wrong with the lights. I would run my sound check, make sure the sound all sounded right, nothing was out of the ordinary. 6 o'clock, the actors would arrive. I would check them in again. 6 o'clock to 6.20, I would check the stage, make sure there was nothing on it that wasn't supposed to be there, dirt, debris, anything that would have come in when people were working on the stage. Uh, yeah, I would check that the props were all there. We had a few buckets of water. It would be my job to make sure they were all filled up at the right level and everyone had their props in the right place. Uh, at 6.20 to 6.30, I would lead the actors in warm-ups. Um, this was something handed over to me by Mr. Perkins, and throughout the run of the show, I always led them in their warm-ups. At about 6.30, I would go and check with the house manager, who runs the, uh, the actual house of the theater where the audience sits, and I would ask him if we were good to give the half-hour call. He would say yes, or no, if he didn't feel like it, but usually yes, and then he would open up the house to the audience to come in. At that time, I would go and give the actors their half-hour call. From 6.30 to 7 o'clock, I would normally be in the tech booth playing the uh, pre-show music that plays over while the audience fill, files in and sort of sits and enjoys their time. Um, I would give the 5, 10, and 15 minute calls to the actors, which basically tells them how much time they have left before showtime. Finally, when it was after the 5 minute call, I would go to the house manager and check with him and make sure I had the go call to start the show. If I got the go call, I would go and give the actors their places call, meaning they were all to go to their places behind stage, get ready to start the show. I would come back to the tech booth, I would flick the lights, telling the audience to get in their seats, and then after a minute, giving them time to sit, I would turn off the lights, start the pre-show, and the show would go. So from seven to nine would be the show time. During that time, I would run the lights, run the sound. At intermission, I would bring the lights back up, give the actors their intermission break, bring us back from intermission, go back into the second act. Finally, at nine o'clock to 9.15 would be the post-show. I would check out the actors, and I would always clean up after them on the stage, make sure all the things were put back for the top of the show so we could start promptly the next day. We did about 14 shows. So what exactly was I doing during the show? Well, I was up there in my tech booth, and in my tech booth I had a soundboard, a lighting board, a CD player, and my cue script. My cue script would tell me when I needed to bring in the lights, bring in the sound, bring out the sound, bring down the lights. Um, a typical cue would go something like this. 
I would hear my line telling me that it was time to bring down the lights. I would bring in the music, start it on the CD player, make sure it's at the right volume. Once the music had played for about a second, I would start the lights. The lights would go down. In the dark, the actors would move their set pieces on, change scenes. When I could see sort of that they were all off stage and everything was ready to go, I would bring back up the lights and slowly fade out the music. Now, that might sound a little bit easy, but if I do this wrong, I end up with A, music playing over actors' lines, B, actors standing awkwardly in silence with no music, or C, I bring the lights down on them while they're trying to work. Um, so it takes a lot of coordination and real focus on the show and everything that you're doing in here in the tech booth. I'm glad to say this show got to impact many groups. We had about 400 people come to see the show uh, in the audience. Specifically, Penny for Arts. We worked with them one night. And if you don't know what Penny for Arts is, they're a Knoxville nonprofit whose goal is to let every child in Knoxville be able to see a performing art of some kind. So the way it works is a child can come into a theater or a concert or a dance performance, and they only have to pay a penny as long as they're accompanied by an adult. I'm very happy we got to work with them. Those are some people who usually probably wouldn't get to see theater, and I'm happy they got to see our message. I also hope I had an impact on the actors. Um, I've seen a lot of stage managers work, and I know they have a big impact on the actor's time in the show. And so I made sure that I was friends. I tried to make friendships with all these actors. Some of them I didn't know, some of them I did. The ones I didn't know, I made friends with. And the ones who I already knew, it was fun because I hadn't seen them in a while, so it was like forging new friendships with them, renewing their friendships. Finally, the theater staff. I worked a lot with Mr. Zach Allen and Mr. Dennis Perkins, my director, and I hope I modeled for them hard work and a good work attitude, work ethic. And I sort of mentioned a lesson I learned, and that's probably the most important was I learned a valuable lesson about how to lead teens in, in a formal setting. It's not easy leading people your age and a little bit younger especially in a formal setting like theater. Um, and so I had seen a lot of stage managers. I've seen good stage managers. I've seen not so good stage managers. And so I took lessons from both of them and tried to model, my, model myself into a good stage manager. And I think we succeeded. The thing I was aiming for was some stage managers want to have all the fun with the actors. Some want to be their boss, their tyrant, want to rule over them, make sure they have no fun. I tried to find a good mix of that. Because when you can have fun, but they still respect you as the authority figure, that's when you can get some good work done as actors and as stage managers. Second, and more pragmatically, it was my first chance to apply organizational tools that I use in school outside of school. So how I organized my binder, how I kept notes, sticky notes to remind me of things, basic things like that. And I'm, I'm glad to say it worked. I did not lose anything major. Everything went pretty smoothly. Looking back, there are a few lessons I wish I had, wish I had learned more about, um, particularly the lighting design process. Um, like I said, I worked a lot with the set designer. He was all by himself and he sort of needed another hand just to help him along. And so I didn't get to spend a lot of time learning about the uh, lighting design process and how that works. And I got to see little tidbits of it and it interested me, but I never got to learn of it. So I just used their lights and didn't know how they came up with that process, what inspired them to make the lights look a certain way or how they programmed that into the system then. Second, I wish I had taken a stage management class. <laughs> um, it's a little bit awkward to say, but there were times where Mr. Perkins is explaining very basic concepts to me that I feel like if I had taken a class, I would have known already and he wouldn't have to waste his time explaining to me this process. Finally, I wish I had been a bit more confident. Um, if I had been more confident going in, I feel like I could have forged friendships with some of the technical uh, directors a bit more. And Lauren's like with the costume people, I didn't ever really get to know them, probably because I was a little bit insure, unsure of what I was doing. Those are, my, those are my regrets looking back, things I think I missed. Advice for future stage managers. First, be organized. Um, you handle a lot of paperwork. Um, I can't tell you how much I had to keep track of and you need it on a moment's notice. The director wants the report from last week and what we did, you need to remember that or have it on hand nearby. So organization is critical and I had to really work on that to make sure I was on top of that. Second, stay calm. Um, a lot of pressure is on you. The, the show, a lot of aspects of the show are depending on you performing and doing your job correctly. And if you don't, it's bad. So you've got to stay calm and not stress yourself out about that. And sort of connect to that, have fun. Because like I said, that's a lot of pressure to work under. That part of the show does depend a lot on you. 
and your ability. So you need to have fun. If you're not enjoying some aspect of the show, I mean, that pressure is going to get to your head really quick and you're just going to be really stressed out. That's not fun for anyone. Do I plan on continuing this project in the future? I can give you a resounding yes. I thoroughly enjoyed stage managing. It was a side of theater I hadn't seen. I have always worked on the stage and never worked back behind the stage and gotten to appreciate what they do. The technical directors, the director, and the stage manager. All the work they put in, they put in a lot of work that usually goes unseen or not appreciated. I would love to continue stage managing in the future. I learned a lot of valuable lessons and I feel like it's very, very important for theater. Thank you for your time and attention.